90 to 95 percent of these tend to be the classic typical dural based meningiomas now all of you might remember that you can you have seen meningiomas as small as two to three millimeters in size but with a florid brain signal abnormality or attenuation change in significant uh, mass effect associated with it and people must have seen 10 centimeter size meningiomas with absolutely no brain changes or absolutely clear subjacent brain so what is the relation to this why do some meningiomas do that basically it what happens is there is toxins released by this and the closer and and more adherent to the meningioma to the brain parenchyma the worse the reaction so the size of the neoplasm has absolutely no relation with the abnormal signal intensity but it has direct relation to the resectability the ones that we see with significant brain changes significant attenuation or signal abnormality within the surrounding brain or significant associated mass effect with that is basically because of the adherence of the meningioma and release of toxins directly into the brain parenchyma and the surgeon will have difficulty resecting that and post-op examination you will see that there's portions of the brain which ended up got getting resected along with the meningioma and typically the patient has a subjacent restricted effusion because of ischemia in the subjacent brain parenchyma whereas these huge meningiomas with no brain changes they just come off without any difficulty by the surgeon and they are completely resected without any secondary brain changes so that signal abnormality has direct relation to the resectability of the mass lesion so this is what we have to keep in mind so this was an example CT example of an extra axial lesion intensely enhancing on contrast uh, administration this was a post contrast scan so extra axial lesion with this kind of enhancement unless proven otherwise it is going to be a meningioma now meningios may be uh, maybe entirely calcified partially calcified centrally calcified punctately calcified they can follow any form of calcification this was a meningioma which was densely calcified lobulated in appearance this is a ct as well an mr appearance where there is susceptibility or signal loss on t1 sequence where minimal associated mass effect is identified and we can see the hyperostosis associated with the subjacent bone now this being a extra axial tumor frequently what we'll see is a csf cleft that separates it so there'll be a grind this would be best seen if we do a a thin slice t2 sequence what you will see is a rind of csf intensity csf fluid completely lining the uh, meningioma separating the brain parenchyma with buckling of the gray matter uh, gray white uh, matter on the underlying brain so that would be what would be described as a csf cleft sign in a meningioma classically associated with convexity meningiomas uh, on diffusion sequences this will be associated with uh, restricted diffusion just like how round blue cell tumors so this was an T2 and T1 uh, post contrast sequence which shows iso intense uh, to gray matter signal intensity extra axial mass lesion with buckling of subjacent brain parenchyma and we can on this one we can see uh, CSF cleft as well as those T2 hyper intensity which we are seeing along the lateral and posterior aspect in the uh, frontal lobe there that is the secondary brain changes uh, so some sort of edema so this would have some difficulty in resectability again not significant but there would be some because there is associated brain changes and on contrast administration there is intense enhancement of this mass lesion with associated dural tail again this is going to be a meningioma one of the things that you have to keep in mind when you see a dural based enhancing mass is metastatic disease dural based metastasis and typically the prostate cancer metastasis can frequently fool us very very frequently it can give an identical appearance of uh, meningioma stay stable for a long period of time and suddenly starts growing then you should think of either a malignant malignant conversion of the meningioma a malignant meningioma or a prostate cancer metastasis that has started progressing but they can behave in a very very similar fashion where they are dormant for a long period of time and suddenly start growing so always think if you see a meningioma changing characteristics and the patient is a male patient think of a metastatic prostate cancer so when do you suspect that the meningioma is a malignant meningioma when you see rapid growth or there is a brain or bone invasion or it suddenly starts changing characteristic but like i mentioned with this always think of prostate cancer metastasis also and uh, sometimes what happens is when the meningioma is located in the supracellular region which is a very very common location for the meningioma 
it is becomes very difficult to differentiate whether that is, that is a pituitary macroadenoma or it is a meningioma and treatment for this there is some variability and the surgeons insist on asking us what is this is this a meningioma or is this a pituitary macroadenoma and there are some ways where we can differentiate now think of meningioma as a round blue cell tumor we say, said that this is a tight tumor this is has density to it this has strength to it so what would it do when it is situated in that it will have uh, when it starts encasing vessels, it will actually narrow the vessels. Whereas macroadenoma, pituitary macroadenoma is a very, very soft, pliable tumor, which you, both of these will encase vessels. But pituitary macroadenoma would not decrease the caliber of the vessel. Meningioma would actually decrease the caliber of the vessel. And the second study that can be done is a nuclear medicine study where this takes up, meningioma takes up octreotide. So on octreotide scan, the meningioma would be positive, whereas uh, pituitary uh, macroadenoma would be negative so these are the classic features remember round blue cell tumors lymphoma meningioma primitive neurectodermal tumors and uh, germinomas all will have the same characteristics densely packed tumors hyperdense on ct iso intense to slightly hyper intense on t1 t2 intensely enhancing tumors with diffusion so this is another one that i talked to you about that the meningiomas can be from many multiple locations we saw those multiple examples of it along the convexity this is arising from meningeal uh, cells inside the ventricular lining this is a typical classic appearance of a meningioma within the ventricular lining iso intense to gray matter signal intensity restricted diffusion with a, a true restriction seen on adc as dark and intense enhancement on contrast administration this is an intraventricular uh, meningioma so moving on from that, since we are on the along the meningeal line, uh, let's talk about uh, enhancement along the left meningeal. So what? How do you know there is patchy meningeal dural versus left meningeal enhancement? So dural lining, as we talk about, it hubs the bone. It is along, uh, goes along the fox. So a patch meningeal dural enhancement will be along the bone. It will not dip in into the brain parenchyma. Whereas the PL lining or leptomeningeal lining lines the brain parenchyma is the PL lining. It dips along the cell side. It does not touch the bone. But it will touch the bone in the concept of that it is along the surface of the uh, gyri also. So that way, yes, it will be touching the bone. But actually, every single cell side will be lined by the uh, PL lining and in leptomeningeal meningeal enhancement that is what is we'll see is enhancement so here this is a pre and post contrast administrate uh, ct scan so you you can see that there is enhancement going inside deep inside the cell side dipping in so uh, yes there is enhancement along the surface because the pr lines along the surface also but the fact that it is dipping in this is going to be a leptomeningeal enhancement now when we see leptomeningeal enhancement immediately we should think of a differential what can it be infection yes it can be that but the classic differential would be sarcoid lymphoma leukemia granular matters infections like tuberculosis or metastatic disease which is leptomeningeal carcinomatosis which is from breast and lung classically these are the things that we see when we see leptomeningeal lining and the classic test to be done is csf and cytology and we will know exactly what it is now when you see abnormal signal on that enhancement on the along the peer lining you we know there is a leptomeningeal disease how do we figure it out when there is no contrast administered supposing the patient got an mr uh, of the brain without contrast what we have to see is on flare sequences so on flare sequences when you see the hyper intensity within the csf spaces as we are seeing over here two different patients on the first one there is along the right precentral and central sulcus and compare it to the opposite side where we clearly see a csf sign the other side we don't see that so an artifactual appearance can be seen when there is edema in this area but if there is no edema there's no mass effect then think of something sitting within the csf spaces and the second one there is diffuse abnormal signal intensity throughout within all the csf spaces so just like you have a differential of when you see alveolar opacities that alveoli can be filled up with fluid protein cell pus those are the things exactly the same way you should have uh, when you see abnormal signal intensity on flare sequences 
within the brain. The first thing that you should make sure is was the patient sedated. If the patient was on supplemental oxygen or he was sedated uh, during anesthesia and he was given oxygen, free oxygen radical hyperoxygenation can do that. So that is an iatrogenic thing that has no relation to pathology. And this is very, very frequently seen in pediatric patients who are getting MR scans under sedation or under anesthesia. If it is not the case, then you have to think of pathology. It can be blood from subarachnoid hemorrhage. It can be pus from infection. It can be recent gadolinium injection or multiple doses of gadolinium within the past 24 to 48 hours or it can be cellular debris which can be tumor cells or leptomeningeal carcinomatosis or infection or uh, uh, something growing within the CSF spaces. So that is your standard differential when you see something within the CSF spaces. You see this, you bring the patient back either for CSF evaluation clinically or you bring the patient back for post contrast to confirm that this some leptomeningeal disease and when you do give contrast this is what it does there is enhancement dipping in inside the cell site there is enhancement along the surface of the brain parenchyma now this was a patient of tuberculosis so he was uh, this is granulomatous disease but fungal infection would do the same thing leptomeningeal carcinomatosis would do the same thing so this is confirming that the patient has leptomeningeal disease again this is not what is going to kill the patient immediately. Look at the patient. He's got hydrocephalus. See those temporal horns, massively dilated. See that aqueduct of sylvius, massively dilated. That is what you have to hold the patient back and call the clinician, whether he needs to go to the ER or he needs to go to the clinic to, the, to see the clinician. This patient should not go home with that kind of ventricular system. Always look at those, what used to be called, it, look at the corner of the films. Here we have to look at all the associated findings. Don't get bogged down that you see a positive finding. Then uh, that is very very common with even the most experienced uh, radiologists that we get bogged down when we see one positive finding and tend to ignore all the other positive findings so anyway this is a case of leptomeningeal carcinomatosis so when we see a meningeal or leptomeningeal or patchy meningeal enhancement what do we do how do we differentiate neural enhancement this is going to be lining the bone. It will hub the calvarium. It will not dip into the sulci. Differential for this would be infection, intraquinial hypotension, multiple lumbar punctures, recent lumbar puncture, or dural based metastasis. How do we call whether the dura is enhancing? When you see more than three consecutive slices of enhancement on a coronal sequence, we call it abnormal dural enhancement. If you see it on one or maybe two, it may be a vessel or partial voluming. But if you see on on three or more consecutive slices then it is abnormal dural enhancement we should take that as abnormality uh, besides this of course sarcoid lymphoma leukemia is always something that we can throw in the differential that is associated with dural enhancement also leptomeningeal enhancement the classic appearance is it dips into the sulci very fine enhancement lines all the pl lining differential for this again would be sarcoid lymphoma leukemia but you have to think of leptomeningeal disease we talked about all the differential of those leptomeningeal disease which just went through uh, leptomeningeal, including leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. That would be the differential for that is how you differentiate between meningeal enhancement. Lastly, we will quickly go with, through with the metastasis. Just think about this that all metastases behave like their primary tumor. So, uh, if, if a primary tumor is a tumor that calcifies, then the metastasis will have a tendency of calcification. So, uh, you see a calcified metastasis, multiple lesions. When do you think of metastasis? When you see multiple lesions, of course, think of it that the most common solitary brain mass in an elderly patient or an adult patient is going to be a metastasis but we think of metastasis when we see multiple lesions now here is a case of multiple calcifications within the brain parenchyma with associated mass effect if there was no mass effect this could have been old granulomatous infections even if there is a mass effect this can still be a granulomatous infection it could be still be cysticercosis but in an older patient think about uh, metastasis again calcified metastasis exceedingly rare the tendency should be to go in favor of granulomatous disease or neurocystic sarcosis or a dying cyst which would all give this kind of appearance with some cysts having calcifications but calcified metastasis is a possibility that classic metastasis associated with calcification would be from gut tumors like mucinous adenocarcinomas or originally bone producing uh, uh, neoplasms like osteosarcoma chondrosarcomas hemorrhagic metastasis if the primary tumor is hypervascular metastasis would tend to be uh, hemorrhagic in nature so think about the primary hypervascular tumors it would be renal cell carcinoma melanoma thyroid carcinoma choriocarcinoma these all would give classically hemorrhagic metastasis but even though lung and breast 
in itself do not typically cause hemorrhagic metastasis. They are so common that between the two of them, they outnumber overwhelmingly the classically hemorrhagic metastasis. So if you see a case of hemorrhagic metastasis, chances are it's going to be lung and breast, even though the typical metastasis of which bleed are from renal cell carcinoma, melanoma, thyroid, choroid carcinoma. So those would be the differential for a hemorrhagic metastasis. Think of new that bleed on its own. Now, uh, this is a case of typical metastasis where you have uh, central necrosis, peripheral enhancement, multiple lesions. But on diffusion sequence, you, what you are seeing is kind of an unusual appearance. Uh, you see restricted diffusion, this broadens your differential. You have to think about a microabscess, an abscess, a septic emboli. Keeping in mind that small hemorrhagic metastasis do cause restricted diffusion. Now, this was a case of a small hemorrhagic metastasis that was causing restricted diffusion. But when you see a restricted diffusion with peripheral enhancement, your first thing, something that is going to be rapidly killing the patient, rapidly deteriorating, would be a septic emboli, endocarditis, abscess. Those are the things you want to rule out. Once you have ruled those out, then you think of a hemorrhagic metastasis or a metastatic disease. So this was, these are two, these are, this was a case of hemorrhagic metastasis. So again, last, what I want you to take home from all my lectures is all neoplasms, masses have mass effects. Think of what is going to kill the patient immediately, herniation, hydrocephalus. These are the things you have to watch out in all neoplasms. Once you recognize a mass, the patient has enough time to be treated for that. But if a patient has associated obstructive hydrocephalus, herniation, subfalcine, transtronic herniation, the patient does not have more than 24 hours. He can die potentially in 24 hours. Yes, it's not necessary that he's going to die from the herniation, but that is what kills the patient very very quickly so that is what you have to keep in mind whenever you are looking at it then depending on your practice i have told this again and again and again if you are in a neuro oncology center you have to give a more detailed correct approach to what the neoplasm is you have to give a relatively potential cell line of what the tumor is arising you have to on follow-up examination think of the genetic underlying mutations and then you have to talk about that and whether there is recurrent residual tumor or radiation necrosis post treatment change if you are in a diagnostic neuro radiology what you your most important thing is to recognize what the kind of tumor is you have to keep in mind that this is a neoplasm it is what associated with masses it is associated with secondary changes like hydrocephalus or herniation those are the things you have to and you have, you have to keep in mind if you are a general radiologist it is important for you to recognize that differentiating between acute versus a chronic condition things like infection versus neoplasm these are the things you should be able to differentiate and then you should be able to refer it to correct appropriate person and make sure that a benign condition doesn't get operated and a malignant condition doesn't go home i hope my lecture was of uh, help to you in uh, furthering your knowledge of brain neoplasms um, i am glad i got this opportunity to speak to you and thank you